But uh, this morning, if you'd like to turn with us, we're going to be reading out of the book of Proverbs, uh, the book of Proverbs, the fifth chapter, the book of Proverbs, the fifth chapter, and if I had a thought, it would be navigating with a broken compass. And I know that may sound like a weird thought, but I'll kind of give you a little backstory about how that, that thought came to my heart. Uh, I was reading this week, there was a news blurb that popped up on my computer, and I found it rather disturbing. Uh, the title of the, the little news article was Nine Bible Verses That Need to Be Omitted. Nine Bible Passages, sorry, Nine Bible Passages That Need to Be Omitted. And, and I, I could pretty much surmise by the uh, person that, that wrote the news article that they really probably were not a believer. Uh, they, they railed against the Bible about how that the Bible was old and it was outdated and how that the passages was relevant in today's time. That uh, they need to leave out the verses that have to do with homosexuality, about uh, man and woman's relationship with one another, about how that, that we come to know Christ. That their, their thought behind the article was that, hey, all those verses were once relevant in a different time, but now they are no longer relevant. And I found that to be rather disturbing. And I thought to myself, you know, no wonder the world is in the shape that it's in. That if we come to the point and we come to the place where we feel like that the Word of God has lost its relevance, and I'm not talking about just, just parts of it, but the whole Word of God. Because I believe from in the beginning in Genesis to Amen and Revelation is all relevant for our use the Bible tells us it's made for rebuke and reproof, and it's made for instruction. It's made for us to have something to live by and to guide ourselves. It's no wonder that the world has gotten to the shape it's in. I started thinking about how that uh, we have lost our, our moral compass and how that, that we no longer understand why the Word of God says what it does. And as I got to study about that, uh, it brought to mind, have you, I don't know if you've ever used a compass or not, but a compass is really a pretty simple uh, thing if you know what, how the operation of it works. It works basically on a magnetic principle. So a compass has a magnet, it has a needle that is attached to it. And, and in theory, that, that compass, when you open it up, the magnet will always turn to magnetic north. And no matter where you're at in the world, no matter where you're, what you're doing, if the compass is operating properly, no matter where you go or which way you turn, that compass will turn towards magnetic north. Now, in the recent past, there's been uh, some scientific stuff that's come out that says, suggests that the earth is shifting its poles, that north will no longer be north and south will no longer be south, that, that due to whatever influence, and I said this happens according to science ever so many thousands of years that the earth's poles will shift and that it will, and, and when it does, that everything that we know, everything that, that we are associated with, with direction, even GPS, which operates on a principle of north and south, will no longer work like it did. And I thought, you know what? Maybe that's physically true, but if ever there was a time that was spiritually true, today is that time. Poles have shifted. They have turned, and they have, they're no longer pointing a true way. In the book of Proverbs, in the fifth chapter, in the 21st through 23rd verse, it says, For the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. He shall die without instruction, and in the greatness of his folly he shall go astray. Now, I know you say, well, what does that have to do with anything? That's just one of them old Proverbs. That's just one of them old scriptures that really doesn't have any relevance to us today. But there is a lot of relevance in this scripture because it tells us that our ways are before the eyes of the Lord. And the Bible also teaches us that in every man's eyes, his ways are right. I look at my ways and, and in my conceit or my pride or my human nature, I may think that I'm right. I'm going to ask you a question this morning. Have anybody here ever been in an argument? 
I would say the majority of us, if we were honest, has probably, we've probably argued with someone or some point before in our lifetime. And the reason we do so is because why? Because we are right. You never argue from a wrong point, do you? Have you ever looked at your spouse or your brother or sister or your friend or your neighbor and said, I'm going to argue this point because I'm wrong? Probably not. You probably argue the point because you say, I'm right. Now, there are times that I will admit in my own marriage that I've argued points, knowing that I might have been somewhat less right than I should have been, but I still argue the point from the basis of being right. I'm right, or I wouldn't argue it. Well, that's the problem with humans is oftentimes we always think we're right. We always think our way is the best way. We always think our way is the only way, and that every other way has to be wrong because it's not our way. The Bible teaches me that we are not to be so conceited or prideful in our own lives as to think that the way that we want or the way that we see it or the way that we envision it is always right. That our ways are before the Lord. The problem is so many times we trust in our way. When was the last time that you went to the Lord in the word of prayer and you said, Lord, I want to go your way, even if it means it's not what I want? God, I want what you want for my life, even though it may not be what I want. God, I want your way for my life, even though it's going to be a harder road to travel. I want you want what you want for my life, even though it's going to be a little bit more difficult. It's going to require more effort. I'm going to have to get more serious about your word and your spirit and learning how to, to listen for your beckoning call. God, I'm going to have to be more serious about that, but I want what you want for my life. Oftentimes, I think that we, we want what we want, and we want God to want what we want. God, I want this. God, I want, I, I mean, how do you want, you know, something so simple as death. We was there at the, at the nursing home the other day as Andrew's mom was passing, and, and uh, we had family members that came in, and they told me, said, you know what, I do not want this. I don't want to ever be here. I don't want this. I want, you know, I, I want to die like I want to die. And basically, that's what we want, right? If I had my, if I had my way, I'm going to be somewhere in my late 90s. I've, I've done, I've done come, somewhere in my late 90s, early 100s, you know. I'm going to have a good day on the farm, you know. We're going to have a big meal afterwards. The kids will be there, maybe grandkids, maybe even great-grandkids. But at that point, you never know. And then I'm going to go to sleep with Andrew by my side, and we're both going to go at the same time. We're going to wake up in heaven together. That's pretty much the plan, right? And I really want God to want what I want. But I realize that that may not be God's plan for my life. And if I want to be the spiritual creature in which I need to be, then I need to look to God and say, God, I want what you want for my life. And it doesn't matter where you take me or where I go, but God, I want you to be the author and finisher of it. Apostle Paul talks in the scripture about how when he was on his missionary journey that he wanted to go to Asia. And he said, I, he said, I had purposed in my heart that I was going to Asia, but the Holy Spirit forbade me to go. And he said, so I didn't go. He said, I wanted to go. I had planned to go. I had made preparations to go. But the Holy Spirit said, nope, you're not going, and I didn't go. How many of us would be so willing to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit? In order to do that, we must be navigating with a proper compass, right? The Holy, the Holy Spirit that guides our compass, we must have a true point to point towards. In the book of Judges, in the 17th chapter, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his eyes. If ever there was a day we live in and where people are doing what is right in their eyes, today is that time. If you want to do it, do it, right? If you want to take it, take it. If you want to drink it, drink it. If you want to look at it, look at it. Whatever it is you want to do, just do it, and you will let the consequences fall where they may, and then if God doesn't like it, then that's no problem of yours. He's just going to have to catch up with your thinking. Now, I know we that sit here as Christians say, well, that would be a bad move. God, you're going to have to follow along with me and do whatever I want to do. Can I ask you a question today? Are you leaving, living your life following what God is, is directing you to, or are you directing your life hoping that God follows up with you? God, this is what I want. 
God, this is the relationship I want. God, this is the life that I want. God, this is where I want to live. This is where I want to work. This is what I want to do. This is who I want to do it with. God, and, and you've got to follow up with me. Rather than saying, God, I want your provision in my life. God, I want to be where you want me to be. God, I want to, I want to live where you want me to live. God, I want to work where you want me to work. God, I want, I want to be with who you want me to be with. God, I want to search your word. I want to find out what's healthy in relationships. I want to find out what's healthy in life. I want to find out what the Bible says about it, and I want to apply that to my life. And in so doing, I'll be following your direction and not my own. When there was nobody to, to give any kind of moral compass in the, book, in the land of Israel, in the book of Judges, here's what happened. Everybody did whatever they wanted to do. That's why God appointed judges. One of the most misused scripture in the Bible is judge not lest you be judged. You say, Brother Andy, I don't want to be judged. Well, I've already been judged. The day that I became a sinner, the day I reached the age of accountability, the day that I realized that I could not save myself and that I was not worthy of heaven, I was judged at that point and I was found guilty of judgment. I was found guilty of being a sinner. I was found guilty of coming short. But praise God, there became an advocate for me and he came and he applied salvation to my heart and he saved my soul and from then on that judgment has went somewhere else because it's not my judgment anymore. I have been found clean and pardoned through the blood of Jesus Christ. But as we look at judgment, there has to be some, right? It's what brings our moral compass into being. That's why God gave laws because mankind could not do it for himself. That's why the Ten Commandments came into being is because mankind couldn't get it right. And then what happened, even with, with guiding principles of the Ten Commandments, God still couldn't, we, could, we couldn't do it then either. But there has to be some sense of moral compass, right? There has to be some way of knowing what is good and what is bad. You can't just go through life with absolutely no compass because can you imagine... Can you imagine today? Yesterday I went to, to a, did a wedding up in, in the Smoky Mountains and I had absolutely no clue where I was going. One of the greatest inventions ever is a GPS. I just spoke it into the phone and there I went. You know what happens though? What, can you imagine if, if there was no direction? Can you imagine if there was no direction? Uh, let's just say I want to go to Gatlinburg. Okay, drive. Which direction? Doesn't matter. Well, do I need to go north, south, east, or west? Doesn't matter. Just go. Well, how am I going to get there? Doesn't matter. There is no direction. Well, I would really like to say it. Doesn't matter. You see, there has to be some sense of direction, right? If I know that Gatlinburg lies to the east, then I know that I'm going to have to drive east to get there. Now, it may be in a wide range of east, but I know I'm going to have to go east to get there. If there is no direction, I could go anywhere. And that's exactly what happens when we are living our life and we are taking our direction from a compass with a broken needle is that we have no direction. So we must look and see where we gain direction at. God himself in the book of Isaiah, the fifth chapter, says this. He said, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. I've worked with people before that thought, and maybe you've been around people that think they know everything. How do you do that? Well, let me tell you how you do that. And then when you do it and it doesn't work, they come to find out in reality they had no clue at all what they was talking about. They had no way, of, I mean, it was just, it would be like, it would be like Patrick asking me how to do carpentry work. It wouldn't be wise. It wouldn't be prudent. Now, if I want to know how to build something, I'd know where to go. If you want to know how to wire something, come and ask me. If I need to know how to weld something, I'm going to Lakota. Because he knows how to weld. I don't know how to weld. I know the basic principle of it, but other than that, I don't, I'm not good at it. It looks like, it looks like a, a blind ape did it whenever I can get done. And there's little daubs everywhere, and there's little burn marks everywhere. And the welding rods that are stuck to whatever I'm welding look like a bunch of porcupines stuck out everywhere. 
So I know my limitations, and I know that I have to have some direction. In life, we must have some direction, and I wonder if you know where that direction comes from. Well, the direction is very simple today, and we find it in the first chapter of the book of John. If you want an absolute, if you want a truth, if you want something to guide your life, and I'm not talking about just pieces of it. I'm not talking about just parts of it. I'm not talking about just the parts that you want to digest, not the whole thing. You must take the Word of God in its entirety. And it doesn't matter if you don't like the passage. It doesn't matter if you don't like the way it's worded. It doesn't matter if you don't agree with the principle because that's the great thing about the Word of God, I, and I'm so glad for this, that God never asked my opinion about it. And I'm going to go out on a limb and say He never asked your opinion about it. That the Word of God is the inspired Word of God given to holy men of old to, to, to be put to pen so that you and I could have an instruction booklet. It's, this book spanned the course of several thousand years penned by multiple authors all pointing to the same place. Which could never happen without it being inspired by God through and by the Holy Spirit. That would have never happened that way. You couldn't take a book that was started 2,000 years ago and write something that falls right in line with it without being led by something to fit so perfectly as the story is written. It happens to be that the Word of God is the Word of God and that it is God. So when you start carving out pieces of the Word of God that you don't like, you're trying to carve out a piece of God. How do I know that? In the book of John it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. If you want moral compass, if you want a place to know where to go, if you want a direction in life, if you want to know what God says about your life and how he wants you to live your life, then can I encourage you to find that in the Word of God. Why? Because the Word of God is is God. So when you start reading this book, it's more than just ink on paper. It's, you know, and I've heard people, you, you could describe it as the sword, the word, the light. But at the end of the day, the words that are on these pages are God speaking to your heart. I had a friend of mine that was in college, and a professor had asked them to write a paper on a book. He said, write, write, write a poem on a book. And he said, I'm going to give you the book. And he presented the Bible. And she said, what do you mean you want me to write a poem on this? He said, well, it's just a book. And she said, I can't do it. Why can't you do it? Because it's not just a book. He said, no, it's just a book. It's like anything else. It's like, it's like war and peace. It's like grace of wrath. It's like any other book that you would want to read. It's just a book. And she said, I can never look at this book as just a book. She said, to write a poem about this, she said, would be to encompass God that created the universe, that spoke into existence the earth, that separated the heavens and the earth, that hung the sun and the moon, that, that created everything that we know, that called his people unto himself, that pr provided his own self as, a, as his son through, as a savior, that now guides us by the Holy Spirit, and you want me to write it like it's just a book. Just, and she said, there's no way I can ever do that. She said, because the word of God guides me. It, it's my life. It's my light. It's what, what I, I live by. I'm going to ask you today, how many people come in here today hoping that you would find some sense or purpose of direction and say, you know what, I want a sense, I want a, I want a purpose, I, want, I would really know what God wants in my life, I'm just, I, I, I've got this need in my life and I really want to know what God's got for me. And yet, you've never opened the Word of God. It's like this. If I were to try to make a cake and it calls for flour or sugar eggs, whatever else goes in the cake, because I'm not a baker, I don't know. But let's just suppose it only had three ingredients. Let's just suppose that 
that a cake was only made up of eggs and flour and water. And I wanted to make a cake, and I put the flour in there, and I put the eggs in there, but no water. You know what I got? A mess. Or we could put the eggs and the water together with no flour. And what do I have? A mess. Or I could put the water and the flour together. You know what I got? It ain't going to be cake. For a lot of us, we have the idea that God is going to direct us in our lives, and we're only going to put part of the ingredients in. People come to me all the time and say, Brother Randy, I have been praying about what God wants me to do for my life. Really? What else have you been doing? Well, that's pretty much it. You've been attending church? No. Been studying the Word? No. Well, it's kind of like just putting the eggs in the bowl saying that's a cake. It's not. It's an ingredient, but it's not the cake. Or they may say, well, I go to church every Sunday. I'm in church every Sunday. Every time the doors are open, I am there. Every Sunday, every Wednesday, I am there. What else do you do? Well, I pray. Well, that's great. So now you've got two of the ingredients. Now, do you study the Word of God? Well, no, it's been a while since I've opened my Bible. There again, you don't have a cake. Or maybe, maybe you, you hit the Word of God and you open it up and you say, man, this is really good and, and I'm going to open it up and this is where, this is right here is how God is going to, to get my life in order because the Word of God says this, and it says, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning that they may follow strong drink and that will continue until night, until wine inflame them and the harp and bowl and tabre and pipe and, and wine and they are in their feast and they regard not the work of the Lord neither consider the operation of His hands. That's going to guide my life. Well, if that's your approach to studying the Word of God, then there's probably a good chance you're still not going to have a cake. Mine is to get His Word down into my heart. But the, when you get it into your heart, you are speaking His Word, and you don't have to keep going back. But the, the Word of God, the Word of God is a piece of the life that it takes to know your direction. So you must study the Word of God. You must pray for God's direction. And I'm going to give you the third piece of that. You must, you must worship Him. You see, for all so, so many times we, we pray to God, God, I want to know the direction of my life. God, I want to, I'm going to study your Word about it, but God, I forget sometimes to even know who you are in my life. God, you are my God. God, you are trustworthy. You are my Savior. You are the author and finisher of my life. God, you point me in the right direction. God, I don't have to follow the moral compass of some people that, that, that are just, I'm just going to be honest with you, they're, they're, they're non-believers, they're sinners that have never known the grace of God. Because Hollywood says it's acceptable. Because politicians say it's acceptable. Because all these other people say it's acceptable. I'm going to tell you something. If the Word of God don't say it's acceptable, it's not acceptable. I'm going to tell you, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the biggest star in Hollywood says. It doesn't matter what they believe. It doesn't matter if the politicians agree with them. It doesn't matter whatever they say. Because the Word of God is the standard. It is the bar. All other things have to reach that bar. It, it is the guiding principle. It is the true magnetic north. It is where that we point ourselves in, in everything that we do. Now, you can take a compass out and you can spin a compass. And as you spin that compass... That little needle will go in there and it'll, it'll, it'll do this number as you're spinning that compass. But then you set it down somewhere and, and you let it settle for just a second. Here's what happens is that needle will go and it'll point straight north. Every time. If it's working properly, it'll point to straight north. Sometimes in your life, you may be into a place where you're turning around and around and around and around and around and you may be spinning like a top. But if you will settle yourself for just a second and pray, and study the Word of God, and worship Him, then here's what will happen is, you'll find this. It'll point right back to the way it should go. You see, for many of us, I think we're trying to navigate with a broken compass today. We want God to change the direction because that's the way we want to travel. Rather than saying, God, I want to travel the direction you've got for me to travel. God, I want to travel your path. 
remember in the scripture, one of the most familiar uh, uh, passages of scripture, that he is a lamp to our feet and a light unto our path. That he lights our way, he makes our way, he illuminates the path before us. He knows where he wants to take us, and guess what? Everywhere he wants to take you, he will allow that to be the pointer that you need to go to. But I'm going to ask you today, are you pointing yourself towards that direction? Or are you navigating on your own? Have you ever went out, and, and, and as a young man, I would fancy myself, you know, explore or whatever it was, we'd go out, and, and you've, maybe, maybe you've heard the old expression that moth, moss only grows on the north side of trees. That's not true. Moss can grow on any side of a tree. Have you ever tried to go outside and find east and west on a cloudy day? Not much chance. Have you ever went out to look for the North Star when the clouds are overhead? Without the North Star, there's no really way of knowing where the North is, so you're just kind of out there lost. And, and for so many of us, that's our life. We're trying to navigate with no sense of direction. This morning, as the Lord had prepared this message, I was, I was praying about it. I was like, Lord, this message, why, why this message? Why? And I can tell you why. Because obviously, there's somebody here that needs to know that you're going the wrong direction. Maybe you're here, and, and maybe you're just standing there saying, I don't even know which direction to go. I don't know what's next. I don't know where my life is headed from here. Well, can I invite you to take the three basic principles of worship, prayer, and study and apply them to your life to allow God to show you the direction of your life? By doing that, you will, you will know. Now, I can't tell you where the end of it's going to be. I can't tell you where you're going to end up. I can't tell you where the destination is. But I do know this. You've got a general direction. I know... And as we come to a close, I'm going to ask that we all come and get a song. Andrea and I, one time, when Jesse was just a baby, he probably wasn't maybe, maybe six, eight months old, we decided we were going to take a vacation to Myrtle Beach. And, and they had called for a tropical storm out, the, out in the Atlantic for a few days before we left. We was like, ah, don't worry about that. So we went to Myrtle Beach and, and, and they started talking more about this, this Hurricane Frank that was coming and Andrew and I was like, ah, don't worry about that. So we were sitting there eating breakfast one morning. And they said, guess what? There's a mandatory evacuation for Horry County. I was like, ah, don't worry about that. Got back to the hotel, and there was a little note under the door that said, you must leave now. Well, first of all, we was on the eighth floor. I don't know if you've ever tried to get on an elevator in a motel full of people when there's a hurricane evacuation, but forget the elevators. And I don't know if you've ever traveled with an eight-month-old, but everything that you own in your house, you just transfer it to a motel room. So I carried multiple trips down eight floors, back up, back down, back up, back down to pack everything else, only to find out when we got on King's Highway in Myrtle Beach that there was absolutely nowhere to go. We sat in the same spot for two hours along with what looked like two million other people and never moved an inch. And Andrew said, how are we going to get now... Keep in mind, we got an eight-month-old with us, right? That has to be fed and diapers and all that stuff. And said, how are we going to get there? I said, I said, you want to get behind the wheel and you're going to do what I say. She said, well, I said, just do what I say. Just get behind the wheel. Okay. She said, where are we going? I said, that way. She said, what's that way? I said, I don't know. But if the water's that way, we're going that way. <laughs> and she said, how do you know where you're going? I said, listen, honey, listen to me. West is the way. East is there. We're going West. <laughs> And she said, well, what road are we going to get on? Don't matter. We're going west. <laughs> we was going through parking lots. We would cut through behind buildings. We was going through these little residential neighborhoods. We were still going west. She said, how do you know we're going the right direction? I said, because the sun's behind us. We're going that way. We come out about 60 miles up on the highway somewhere up there and got in traffic and flowed the rest of the way. She said, honey, how did you know? I said, because west was that way. I don't know how we're going to get there but I know where I'm going. I don't know the road that God will put me on. I don't know what roads I'll have to travel, but I know where I'm going, and heaven is my home. And as long as I'm headed there, 
Whatever road God puts me on is fine. But I got to be sure that I know the direction. Today I'm going to ask you, do you know that direction? Do you know where you're headed? Do you know that you're headed home? Do you know that it doesn't matter what comes next? All that matters is you're headed the right way with God. As we stand and sing this morning, if you would like to come and pray, I would love to pray with you this morning. I know what it's like. There's been times in my life that I haven't known the direction. I've been spinning around in circles waiting for my needle to finally come to a rest. But when it came to a rest, I knew exactly which way to go. If you're here this morning, your needle's been spinning and spinning and spinning, and you'd like for it to settle in, I would love to pray with you this morning as we sing.